Welcome back. We're here with Troy Fields. We're discussing his journey through ALS. This is chapter four. We're going to start off as he goes through the, what happened with the diagnosis of ALS. Yeah, so uh, we had a, our last set of tests in May 2018 at Mayo. And as June came along, I realized that I had kept that appointment with the specialist at USF that I had made previous November 2017. Um, and sure enough, as he reviewed all the work that Mayo had done in terms of their testing and, and so on, uh, and some of the uh, exam that he, examination that he did uh, at that time in the visit, um, he gave us the news that uh, it was in fact ALS. So he was straightforward and that's the first time you heard the official diagnosis that you had ALS? Yeah, up to that point it was a possibility, but uh, not a confirmation. So this was the first time that we received an actual confirmation of the diagnosis. So I'm sure there's one thing thinking you have it and another thing suddenly knowing. Absolutely. Um, we, uh, it, it, in my mind, I've gone through that exercise and reviewed the possibility that that's what it was. But it's something totally different actually hearing a doctor say that's what it is. Um, and uh, no matter how prepared you think you are, uh, you definitely are not. Can you give us an idea of a glimpse in your mind? Well, I, I think it's a, a little bit of shock, a little bit of confusion. Um, confusion in the sense of, you know, what does this really mean? What, what should I expect? What, uh, what might be next? Um, how much time I have to live? And, and all these questions start going through in, in your brain. You, you feel like there's a sense of urgency that you have to, um, uh, you know, there's so much to do and, and now you have this short amount of time uh, to do it in. Yes. Um, so was there anything else that the doctor shared with you at that time that might have helped? Yeah, it, it's, um, doctor alluded to the fact that, um, he felt that this was a more a, of a slow progressing uh, ALS. And so rather than focusing on a standard three to five year life expectancy, which is the average for ALS patients, um, he, he felt that uh, in my case, it'd probably be uh, go beyond five years. Uh, so there was a bit of you know, silver lining, if you will, and all that, but, um, uh, you know, still pretty, pretty shocking. So just to keep track of timelines, and people may not know this, but when does the time clocks, that you may want to call it, actually start? Well, uh, you mean as far as the life expectancy range? Yes. Um, well, uh, there's not a consensus there. Um, Many publications say three to five years from the date of diagnosis, but there's also um, others that looked at three to five years from the time of first symptoms. Okay. So you go home, you're feeling this way, you're having all these emotions. We're discussing what we're gonna do what what was some of the decisions the quick decisions we had made right off the bat well we we didn't do much then because we then went back to mayo and got confirmation so some of that process didn't happen until we got our second opinion uh from mayo and um but um we didn't really you know, the, the first order of business was that we needed to just kind of talk to to the kids and, and break the news to to the family, um, we didn't really make too much of a you know, decision at that time. I think we still took a while after before we uh, got enough of our wits about us to start really thinking about what would be next. So let's go 
back to the second um, di the second diagnosis when our um, Mayo Clinic said that you had ALS also. So how how was that different from the first one? Um, well, you you kind of hold on to that last little bit of hope, <laughs> and of course, then that gets uh, that gets shut down as well. So now it's the reality sinks in that this is what it is. Um, and uh, kind of my running, you know, joke, if you will, but kind of maybe philosophy of life is that uh, you, you can't swallow the elephant in one bite. So you got to break it down into pieces. So that was kind of my, my thought is we got to break the elephant down in digestible pieces. Um, I didn't really want to be thinking too far ahead. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of focus on more short term, medium term. Um, and uh, because if I thought about the long term, I didn't like the way that story was going to end. So I had to kind of keep it manageable for me and focus on more, you know, immediate um, agenda and, and, and actions that we needed to, to take being aware of the medium and long term, but really focusing on uh, uh, shorter, short, more immediate period of time. Now, knowing this um, not only affects you, but it also affects the family. And if your spouse or your partner, or whoever is with you, they're going through a whole set of emotions on their own, and they may be, as I did, um, sharing their emotions to you, which at the time you're going through your own set. What piece of advice would you give them um, to help maybe you in processing your own thoughts? Um, I think what I what I learned from from that situation, and I would advise others that find themselves in that spot, is um, that. You have to allow for your loved ones to process and, and react on their own. You know, I know with me, I felt bad that I was uh, uh, that I was making you cry and I was making you sad, and, and but I had to allow that. I, I you know couldn't really do anything about it. It wasn't going to change, um, and you needed a, a, to be able to express your your feelings, your, the grief that you feel at that moment. Um, and um, so you have to allow that, that process. They have as much of a right because it affects them just as much. And so you, you have to back off and be supportive of them in the same way they're, they are of you, um, but not repress or, or make them feel bad that they can't share how they feel with you. Do you do you wish that you had had a little more time to process it by yourself before having to say help me through my not really um uh i think that um, part of the coping process is understanding that you have a support system um and so if I think it was beneficial, even if it was brought, you know, it's, it's hard to see your spouse cry you, and, and where you feel responsible for it. But I think it's beneficial to share in that emotion um, and come out it on the other end, uh, perhaps you know, stronger for it because there's an appreciation of what both of you are going through. Well, we're going to stop this particular chapter now. Our dog seems to think it's time for us to be done, and uh, we'll pick it back up again. Thank you very much for chapter four.